Well, we are in this series titled Immovable, and other than it being a really great title for the series, there's a, a tagline that has two phrases that we very, very intentionally crafted that paints a picture that, well, we have to understand helps build uh, our foundation no matter what we face in this life. You see, being immovable means, well, it has everything to do with standing firm, right? That's the foundation in which we stand on. So no matter the, the strength of the storm, no matter the intensity of the storm, no matter what we are facing, right, we can stand firm. And it's about surging forward. So many times, so many times, so, so many times when we face the storms of life, right, we, we just want to hunker down. We just want to kind of go in hiding. We just want to hold on tight. But here's the thing. Over and over, God says, hey, hey, no, no, no. Face the storm. Surge forward. I'm with you. I'll guide you. I'll be your strength. I'll be your comfort. I'll be your your peace. I'll be your power. Like, let's go. And so we want to be, well, people filled with faith, where we stand firm and will surge forward. And in this series, we're going to be looking at, well, four very specific storms. Storms that uh, you have, will face. Storms that, uh, I, t I tell you, maybe you're in them right now. And the, the key reality for all of us, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And not just when, but to what, well, what ferocity and what duration? How strong is that storm going to be? And well, how long is that storm going to last? And for some of you, you you've been in one of those like hurricane level five st storms for a very long time. So how do you stand firm, and surge forward. In this series, we're following along with a storyline of a guy named Joseph. And Joseph, well, he faced all four of these storms with incredible veracity and duration. And we're just going to learn from him of how he faced these storms, how he stood firm, and, oh, by the way, how he surged forward. In part one, we looked at the first storm. It was a relational ambush, and uh, his brothers, literally because of jealousy in their heart, they, well, wanted to kill him. At the last, last minute, a couple of the brothers kind of shifted the plot to kill him, and they decided to throw him into a cistern. But Joseph was facing this relational ambush, something that, well, all of us have face before. And remember, the closer that relationship, the greater huh, the hurt, the greater the feeling of betrayal. So I encouraged all of us to put into the rhythm of our lives, especially when we're facing relational ambush, when we see the storm clouds on the horizon, to ask these three questions. What does love require of me? How do I honor God in the midst of my dishonor? And who do I need to seek wise counsel from. So let me pause and ask, how did you do? Did you find yourself asking yourself one, two, all three of these questions this week? My encouragement for you is to keep these questions in the front of your mind because these questions will guide whether or not you retaliate or that you recalibrate so that you can love like God well, has modeled love to look like. Well, today we're going to move on in this story again as we follow this guy named Joseph. And uh, we're in the book of Genesis. And so we'll, we're going to be in chapter 39. And uh, in verse 2, we're told that the Lord was with Joseph. And that's a line that we don't want to overlook. I mean, God is with him. Why? Because God is a personal God. He's leading. He's guiding. He's present. He's engaged with us. He's engaged with you. And God was with Joseph. And well, that he, he prospered. He prospered in the midst of what he was facing. And it's easy to, to read those words and go, well, yeah, life turned out okay. But remember what Joseph has just lived through. 
It's so easy to remove ourselves emotionally and mentally from these stories in the Bible, but he is just going through one of the most well, intense storms of his life. I mean, remember, he was betrayed from, by his brothers, his own flesh and blood, those he, he, he looked up to, he, he was sold. He stood there as they exchanged his life into the hands of the Ishmaelites for well, some money. He was then enslaved. He was taken to a foreign land, away from anything he knew, to a land that had different customs, different languages, a, a different culture. I mean, everything. Where when he got there, he was sold again, enslaved again into a different, well, a different house. And there, his entire life is severed. This is the storm that Joseph is living through. You talk about difficult. You talk about dark. You talk about wind gusts that is trying to just completely knock him off his foundation. But you see, Joseph understood something that I hope we all hold on to. You see, in the midst of the bad, and Joseph was going through a whole lot of bad, and maybe you right now are going through a whole lot of bad. You know, those moments where you just kind of scratch your head and go, I, I just don't know how much more I can take. Those moments where you scratch your head and you're just like, you take a deep breath and you're like, God, I, I just, I don't have it in me. Uh, you, you, the bad that you just think to yourself, like, like how many more hits can I take? How many bad, more bad phone calls can I receive? How many more bad reports can I handle? How much more bad? And it's so easy when there's bad to only focus on the bad. But Joseph does something so important. And if there's only one thing through this entire series that you hold on to, I hope you hold on to that. In the midst of the bad, mine for the good. That in the midst of the bad, God is still doing good. In the midst of the bad, God is still at work. In the midst of the bad, God is still Moving in the midst of the bad, God still wants to do something so incredible in you and through you, but you got to mine it up. And that takes effort, takes work. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get dirty and dusty and messy, right? Because mining is just dirty and dusty and mess. But you got to mine it up. But there's good there. In fact, we know the end of Joseph's story. I mean, that's the vantage point. And right towards the end of the story, Joseph says something to his brothers. That I don't know when God whispered these words into Joseph's mind. I don't know when God whispered these words into his soul. I think, I mean, this is my own Chris Trothway opinion. I think it was when he got thrown into the cistern. God whispered these words. But whenever God did, Joseph, looking at his brothers, the brothers that betrayed him, and I'm talking years and years and years later, he says, what you intended to harm me, God intended it for good. You gotta hold on to this truth. I mean, my prayer is not, not only do you read these words, but you memorize them. So whenever you face bad, you go, okay, this is bad, but God can take the bad and do good. That in the midst of the bad, just maybe, just maybe God wants to do such an incredible work in you and through you to do good. That no matter how much bad you are facing, and again, I get it. Some of you, the storms are that ferocious, that intense. But you got to hold on. That in the midst of the bad, mind for the good. Because God <laughs> does so much good in the midst of the storm. So Joseph has been sold yet again. He's now sold into, well, the house of a guy named Potiphar who was in charge of Pharaoh's uh, royal guard. I mean, we're talking about a guy that had 
incredible power. I mean, one of the highest positions in Pharaoh's kingdom. And as Joseph mined for the good, he kept climbing that proverbial slavery corporate ladder. He's still a slave. He's still property. But now he has reached the top rung. Why? Because he kept on mining for the good of what God was doing in the midst of the bad. And we're told in verse 6 that Potiphar had left everything he had in Joseph's, uh, Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. I mean, everything is a really important wor- word because guess what? Potiphar had brought this, this slave and over time, Joseph, because God was with Joseph, had earned his trust. So Potiphar had gone all in with Joseph and he did not concern himself with, with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And that seems like a line that's like, just where did that even come from? But even, well, as you read those words, you can almost hear the, the soundtrack of the, the story narrative. It starts to shift. The mood of this the background music starts to shift, and all of a sudden it's like, and Joseph was handsome and well built. And after a while, his master's wife. Now let's pause there. If you know this story, you know you know what happens next. If you never heard this story, <laughs> yeah, you know what happens next. Exactly what you're thinking, that's what's going to happen. Next, and we're told that Potiphar's wife notices Joseph. And this isn't like a notice like, oh, we have a new slave. This isn't a notice like, oh, I haven't met you yet. Oh, this isn't a notice like, oh, you're really gifted at feeding the chickens, right? This isn't the notice we're talking about. It's the notice notice. Why? Because Joseph is young and handsome and strong, and he has a six-pack, and biceps, and other, all right, he is just that strapping young man, and she notices him, and one day, she walks up to him, and says, come to bed with me. And here's where the second storm comes crashing in to Joseph's world. Remember, God was with him. His life as a slave was prospering. He had earned the trust, the loyalty, the respect from Potiphar. And then all of a sudden, the storm clouds that were on the horizon came crashing into his world. What's that second storm? Well, it's temptation's assault. Remember, Joseph, I mean, he's a young man, handsome, strapping young lad. He's a piece of property. And then all of a sudden, Potiphar's wife shows attention to him. And all of a sudden, one day, she says, hey, Joseph, I want you. But listen to how Joseph responds. But he refused. You can almost sense, right? This wasn't a shock to him. Like, like you just know that Joseph had seen the storm clouds on the horizon. He saw them forming. They were getting darker and darker. And he knew what was coming his way. And he was, he was ready and prepared. Listen to the speech he had for her. He goes, with me in charge. He told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted Into my care. My master trusts me. 
Look at these words. I mean, what a well-rehearsed, simple, compacted response in the moment. Do you think Joseph had practiced those words before? Yes! Like, you could just tell. I mean, he was like, okay, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. I mean, like the winks that she probably gave him, the looks, the, the gentle rub of a hand down his back. Like, he just, I mean, for weeks, months, we don't know how long, we, he could see the storm clouds on the horizon coming, and he started to, to practice what he was going to say because he knew what was coming his way. And right when she said, hey, Joseph, come on, come on, come to bed with me. He was ready. He went on. He says, no one is greater in the house than, than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except, except you. Because you are his wife. Temptation assaults all of us. It assaults me and it assaults you. And what we're going to see in, in Joseph's life is he's going to give us three very, very specific actions that he's living out. That my encouragement is for you and for me to live out. Because remember, it's not if temptation is going to assault the question is when and with what ferocity and with what duration. So the first thing that Joseph does to this assault by temptation is to know your no. He refused. Right away, he said no. He didn't say, let me get back to you. He said, well, you know, I'm really busy right now. Let's talk later. I mean, right when finally, again, I think she had led up to this moment for weeks, months. We don't know how long, right? There were the winks and the, the little comments and the little gestures and the little hand just kind of rubbing his back, right? There's these moments, but all of a sudden, when the storm clouds that were on the horizon comes crashing over him, trying to knock him off of his foundation, right away, he said no, and he knew why. You got to know your no. He said, my, my master trusts me, and you are his wife. Do you know your no to the, the storm clouds of temptation that are hovering around on the horizon? Do you know your no? Because so many times people wait until the storm's there, they don't have not only their no, but they don't know why they need to say no. They haven't thought through the no. You see, you got to know your no. And Joseph not only knew it, he had rehearsed. It. And it has to start there. Well, he goes on, or the story goes on. And we're told that he says, How then could I do such a wicked thing and will sin against God? He starts. Looking at her, saying, I, I'm responsible to my master. And oh, by the way, you're married to him. But then he, well, he turns the corner and says, oh, by the way, God's involved in this equation. And ultimately, he says, I, I don't want to sin against God. Now, the word sin is one of those words um, in the Bible, and I, I, I don't know for you when you hear the word sin, maybe you uh, were part of a church or grew up in the church where like just the word sin was used as a sledgehammer just to beat people into oblivion. But my challenge for you is to maybe look at sin in a different set of lenses. 
You see, the word sin in the ancient Hebrew, what the Old Testament is written, is, a, is actually an archery term. It means to, well, it means to miss the mark. You see, sin is all about God saying, here's the bullseye, the center of the target. This is what I want from you. This is what God says. This is what I want from you. This is what I designed for you. When, you. when you start realizing that God, creator God, created you, created me for a, a purpose. He created you specifically to live a life. Jesus said a life to the full. He says, hey, the middle of the target looks like this. And I want you to hit that target. Why? Not, not because God doesn't want you to have fun, not because God is all about the rules, not because God is all about, you know, waiting to catch you to do something wrong, but God knows you and he knows what's best for you and he's created you and designed you and created a framework for you and he's like, there's the middle of the target. That's what I want you to hit. And you see, when it comes to sin, Sin not only impacts ourselves personally. You see, sin isn't just a you thing. And don't miss the word just. I mean, it is a you thing and a me thing, but it's not just. Have you ever heard someone say, well, well, well it's, it's my life? It is your life. But in life, we are all connected, aren't we? And sin isn't just a them thing. So when someone else goes, well, it's my life. What I decide to do doesn't impact you. And here's what we all know. Our decisions don't just impact us. They impact everyone. And sin, which is missing God's mark, what God has designed for us to live out, doesn't just impact us, just doesn't impact that other person. You see, sin is, is a God thing. It starts there. It's so easy just to go, well, yeah, but it's my life, my decisions. And God's like, it starts with me. I formed you. I created you. I designed you. I know what the center of the target is for you. I know what's best for you. And oh, by the way, we're created in God's image, meaning we are created to be in relationship with each other. And sin impacts our relationship with God and it impacts our relationship with every single person connected to us. That's why Joseph was like, man, I'm not going to, I'm not saying yes to you, Potiphar's wife, because I don't want to impact my relationship with Potiphar. I don't want to be a part of anything to impact your marriage. And oh, by the way, I'm not going to sin against God. Well, the story can, continues. We're told that though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her. She didn't quit. Remember, temptation, it's an all-out assault to get you to say yes. But then Joseph does something so intentional. Which leads to this next action. He goes, or even be with her. It's easy to miss that one little or, isn't it? It's easy just to skip over it, keep reading the story. But he realized that temptation's assault had one goal, for him to say yes. And so what did he do? Well, he established a guardrail. What was a guardrail? He refused to even be with her. If he was walking into a room and saw her on the other side of the room, I think he took a left down the hallway. If he went to take out the trash and realized she was 
in the backyard. He decided to take out the trash later. If she was in the kitchen grabbing something to eat and he needed to get the other slaves in the kitchen to start cooking the meal, he might have decided to go do some kitchen prep somewhere else, right? He did everything he could not to put himself into a position where he had to keep saying no. He established a guardrail. What guardrails do you need to establish in your life? Why? Because all of us are one yes away from not just destroying our life, but the lives of people we care the most about. Isn't it true? We're all one weak moment. We're all sudden. We want to say yes and we do, and the destruction from temptation's assault that leads us to sin, again, destroys, breaks, fractures our life and those connected to us, and most importantly, our relationship with God. And Joseph did everything he could to put a guardrail up, to create some separation. Because he wanted to keep saying no. You need to establish guardrails. Healthy guardrails. You need to talk about those guardrails. You should have those guardrails written out, written down. You should have those guardrails shared with people that you trust, that you've brought into your life of accountability. Those guardrails that protect your relationships, that protect if you're married. Your marriage that protects you as a father, a husband, protects you as a boss, a leader. I mean, you think about all the areas where temptation tries to assault you. What guardrails do you need to put into place? And then one day, one day, he went into the house to attend his duties. And none of the household servants were inside. Now, we don't know why they weren't. I kind of wonder if she dismissed them all for the day or for the afternoon. We don't know, but they weren't there. And Potiphar's wife caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But Joseph left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Which leads to the third action Joseph does when Temptation assaults. When the guardrail hasn't worked, what do you do? You run. And you run now. You see, sometimes that's your only out is to run. Maybe that's to run from a relationship, or maybe that's to run from a job. Or maybe that's run from a store, or maybe it's just run from a computer, or maybe it's run from a restaurant, or a run from a, you know, you know. The Apostle Paul was writing this letter to a church, a, a gathering of Christ followers pursuing Jesus. And he wrote these words that are so true. Some 2,000 years ago, they're so true for us to this day. He goes, so if you think you're standing firm, if you think your your foundation is firm, he goes, be careful that you don't fall. It's like, be careful. He goes, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted. So many times, it's so easy for us to put a period there. But you see, Paul didn't put a period there. It's easy to do, though. But God, God's not going to let me be tempted. Why would God let me be tempted? God, God won't do that. But you see, Paul doesn't put a, a period there. In fact, what he writes next is something that... that, that that has to shape how we face the storms of temptation and assault in our lives. He, he, he actually writes, tempted beyond what you can bear. Paul's like, hey, 
you're going to go through temptation in this life. It's going to come, and sometimes it's going to come with a veracity and a duration that's beyond, but it won't be beyond what you can bear. And not only will it be a, a, a storm that, that, that's not beyond what you can bear, Paul goes on and he writes, he goes, oh, by the way, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. For Joseph, the way out was what? He ran out of the house. I mean, literally ran out. That was the way out. What temptation right now is assaulting you? I mean, it, it, it just is begging you to say yes. Or maybe you've said yes. No, that God will always give you a way out. He will always give you a way out. That's why you have to know your no before you have to say no. What are things right now in your life Sin that you want to say no to, no matter how strong temptation is, begging you to say yes. Do you know your no? Are you putting guardrails up in your life so that the moments where you're weak and all of a sudden you want to say yes, you have the guardrails that will help you say no? And maybe, just maybe, you're at a point right now where you need to run. Because remember, Sin's going to create havoc and death and destruction in your life, but it's not just connected to you. And sin in someone else's life is going to create death and destruction and brokenness in their life, but it's not just connected to them. Ultimately, our sin is about sinning against God. And God desires for us to live a life that he created you for. And he's painted the target for us to hit. It comes down to this. What are you going to do? You see, God's never expected us to be perfect. That's a lie I hear people say, well, I'm not perfect. God knows that. But what God has called you to be called you to live out. So pursue him, the life he's created you for. What he's called you, me, to aim for is a target that he says. Within that target is life, life to the full. That's what we need to aim for. That's, that's what we need to pursue. Right now, we want to give you a few moments to process three questions that are tied to well, these three actions. And maybe you need to focus on one more than the other. But right in this moment, wherever you are sitting, remember, we need to practice. Jesus said the foundation is built when we hear we put it into practice. Maximize this moment right now.